INEC says electoral offenders and their sponsors must be prosecuted, even as INEC Chairman Mahmoud Yakubu raises concerns over possible cancellation of 2023 polls. And the NNPP unveils its campaign council and zonal rally to begin on January the 12th. This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anoko. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has stated its resolve to go after those who sponsor electoral offenders in the country. Yakubu said the step became necessary because of those who snatch ballot boxes or falsify election results that they are unlikely to be candidates in such elections. Meanwhile, the INEC chairman, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, has said that the growing wave of election-related insecurity across the country, um, he's also express fears that the trend, if not checked, could lead to the cancellation or postponement of the forthcoming general polls. These claims have, however, been refuted by the Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed. Well, joining us to discuss this tonight is Deji Awabide. He's a legal practitioner and Biodum Shomi, a political analyst. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us on the show tonight. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Great. I'll start with you, Mr. Shomi. Um, a lot of concerns have been raised almost before the close of 2022 about INEC's ability to conduct the selection um, in February. In fact, um, at some point, INEC had to respond to some of those, um, you know, um, concerns. Now, also, with the burning of INEC offices, um, with certain materials, including PVCs, also being lost in the inferno, um, it's 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 calling causing calling for a concern again talking about what the INEC chairman has said professor mahmoud yakubu um raising concerns about insecurity um do you think that this is enough grounds for INEC to say we want to halt the elections if care is not taken yes um when you look at the situation we found ourselves in the country INEC has long time to prepare for this very election. At least they have four years um, notice to prepare for it. In addition to the fact that INEC has a rich experience of conducting past elections in Nigeria, and therefore uh, there should be no reason why INEC cannot um, get set for this very election. One of the major function or the primary function of INEC is to conduct elections it is not to provide security. The functions of INEC has to go, you know, hand in hand, you know, in, in um, cooperation with the security agencies who has the constitutional mandate to provide security in the country and vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, uh, basically, the, 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 the federal government and the state governments are duty bound to provide security through their security apparatus. Now, we have had several attacks against INEC facilities, undermining INEC's preparation uh, for this very election. Uh, for instance, the issue of PVC, some pe people's PVC got burnt, and INEC had to, again, you know, make provision for them to make sure that people can pick up PVCs and vote. Um, some electoral materials were destroyed, including ballot boxes, and INEC had to replace all this. I think, um, if, you if you read what the professor said uh, clearly, uh, you realize that he's making a conditional statement that is, if the trend of attacks continues against INEC infrastructures and materials, it may eventually create a situation where elections cannot hold in, a, in, in some parts of the country. And should this happen, he is actually calling our attention to a provision you know, in the Electoral Act, which is, if the people or the outstanding voters or people who have not voted whose elections were cancelled or rescheduled, you know, if the number is greater than the margin of victory, you know, of any candidate in that, ele in that election, then INEC will not be able to declare a winner. That is basically what the prof was saying. They will not be in a position to declare a winner and therefore there will be a constitutional problem in the country. You have had election. And yet, you cannot declare the winner simply because of the security situation that led to the cancellation. 
And what that basically means is that it means a few areas in the country can basically hold the whole country to ransom. If there is a trouble in an area, maybe with a population of um, 10, 12 million, and then uh, you have the margin of victory uh, of one candidate over the rest uh, to be 3, 4 million, there is no way they would discount that. They will have to take that into account. They are not going to look at how many people that eventually will vote. They will look at the number of voters that are supposed to vote, not even those who are accredited, because accreditation may not have taken place. So this is the major problem, that we may end up in a situation where INEC is not able to pronounce anyone as the winner of the election, even though election has taken place in 80% um, uh, um, uh, parts of the country. So INEC is raising a very genuine concern, a very genuine fear, which the federal government needs to assure the whole country that they are on top of their game. They're going to have to stem the wave of insecurity and attack against INEC facilities so that we can have elections, peaceful elections conducted, you know, in all parts of the country. This is the minimum which um, INEC is asking for. They are not responsible for security. It's none of their business to provide security, but theirs is to organize a peaceful, you know, credible, free and fair elections. And that is what INEC seeks to do. But they cannot do that without a conducive environment, which other security services uh, would have to provide. Um, Deji, just on, off the back of what um, Mr. Shoumi has said, um, if, if everything he said uh, is anything to go by and with what the professor has said, um, also knowing that there are sponsors from what the professor has said, the sponsors of these perpetrators of violence or arson in whatever form that they come in, could this also be the plan of whoever these sponsors are to make sure that these elections don't hold or become so inclusive, inconclusive that we begin to have a constitutional problem. Could this also be what they're looking for? And how do we avert that? Well, you can't really look at that, that this could also be a plan um, by this process of violence. However, what needs to be done is for the security of the country, the police, the DA, to be deployed to ensure that we prevent such uh, an occurrence. Uh, we've always had this issue of unrest. We had the 2020 11 elections, we had the 2015, and now uh, we had the 2019. So it's not new any longer that we have this constant issue of uh, likely uh, insecurity breaches here and there that may prevent the uh, election being conducted by INEC. However, I, I still feel that uh, the alarm that was sounded by the professor is just to keep the federal government on its toes and to uh, basically draw their attention to the dangers um, that INEC will face should this security not be not be. Uh, what's important also is that. Uh, INEC, uh, what they need is the atmosphere, a peaceful environment for their personnel to carry out their task and for the voters to also be able to come out and peacefully cast their votes. And all of that, like the Shomi said, rests squarely on the arms or the shoulders of the, of, of the police and every available security agency. So it's, not, it's nothing new. Ask me, uh, this is that this will, it will go ahead. Elections will go ahead. Even on the INEC website, they have a running clock counting down to the election. I, I believe that today, you have 45 days to the election. It's on the website. So INEC, I believe, is also ready. And uh, for the elections. DJ, I'm so sorry. I think we're having connection issues with you. So I'm just going to go back to Mr. Show Me. Now, um, the federal government has, uh, has chimed into this particular matter. They're saying that there is no such thing as a cancellation. But then 
everybody's looking at the federal government because that's their job to make sure that the, the, the country is safe enough to have these elections. Now, let's not forget, this is not the first time that we're having issues such as this. It may not be this magnitude, but then we've seen arsons um, on government offices, or rather INEC offices, before elections. Um, but it did not necessarily stop elections. Now, let's also consider the fact that many people have been displaced and re-displaced, as we can tell, recently. Plus, the fact that we had a natural disaster and the flooding that also displaced a lot of people. Um, this gives INEC a huge responsibility um, as we get ready for the elections. But if an additional problem of lost PVCs, um, election and electoral materials that need to be reprinted all over again is added to the plate of INEC, um, who's to say that the federal government would not be the one to be blamed right now for all of the things that are happening across the country? Yeah, um, yes. Um, if you look at it squarely, whatever happens, the box stops with the president. The federal government will be blamed if, even if INEC is not properly resourced to carry out their functions. That is not the case currently. What we have is the federal government, um, the, the insecurity situation in the country, and the challenges it's posing to INEC. On one part, the federal government has restated its commitments, um, just like as expressed by the Minister for Information, that they are determined that the election will go ahead. They will not allow the election you know, to, to be derailed or to be cancelled in any form. That is beautiful. That's fine. But there are also constitutional provisions. There are also electoral acts provisions that may inhibit INEC's ability to conduct elections. For instance, if there is violence in any area that affected voting, INEC would have to cancel the results of the election where there is violence. So if should that happen, that didn't mean that the election didn't take place. Some people voted, but INEC will have to comply with the law and cancel it. And that is the problem. The other side of it also is that, which the federal government needs to take account of, is that even though we have voted in the past in, in the Northeast, you know, when Boko Haram was racing flags left, right, and centers and everywhere, this time around, the laws have changed. There are some differences you know, from the uh, previous situation to what we have now. It is not just about having a simple majority. There are now proviso that the margin of that simple majority with a spread of you know, to, uh, to 25% in 24 states of the Federation, in addition to one thing, which is that the margin of victory should not be I, uh, there should not be less than um, the, the, the total number of cancelled um, or rescheduled elections. Otherwise, there will be a hung elections, and that's basically uh, what I mean. So since when we have that provision, that has changed the game. It is not just enough for the federal government to say, yes, we'll make sure elections hold. Election must held in a peaceful atmosphere. If the atmosphere is not peaceful, if it's violent, I make me be compelled, you know, to cancel the results of such um, 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 uh, voting that happen in those areas, you know, violent areas where the total uh, disorderliness. So these are the difference. They, it's, it's good the federal government is assuring the whole country, but we need to help our game. We need to do a little bit more, provide more security for INEC personnel, equipment, and offices, while at the same time, we need to pacify those who are hell-bent on creating problems, on derailing our democracy. And by this, I am not saying that the federal government should arrest or should repress um, self-determination um, agitators. No, that is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that we should go into negotiations, going to open a genuine dialogue with disaffected people in the country with the view to ensure that our, democrat uh, our democratic train is not derailed, you know, by violence or by those who are hell-bent, you know, on uh, creating problems in the country. Addressing or bringing these agitators to the table to have some... Uh, why did we have to wait till this last minute? There had been several opportunities for this government 
to have these so-called dialogue or um, negotiations, and, and that wasn't done. So who's to say that, that towing that line now will work at the dying minute? I'm just curious, because when you, the way you sound, it's like, oh, maybe there's a magic wand that can be just, you know, swung around, and then all things will be good and dandy. Yes, it is true the federal government has had ample opportunity over the years to address some of the issues. Um, which people are agitating over. We should also understand the concerns of um, um, key government operatives like Mr. President, who just uh, simply said, I think I read it today, or he said it yesterday, that um, he fought in the civil war, and therefore he does not want anything that would threaten the country. So, yeah, that's the mindset of Mr. President, and he's not the only one. Most of those who fought in the war, uh, General Obasso, they're of that mindset. But the reality today is that we have a restive youth who are very, very unhappy with the situation in the country. Now, the only way out is to engage them in discussions. We have had so many conferences and uh, national conference and whatnot, we have never bothered to implement any of those reports. We are faced with a new situation where the youths are not even calling for the implementation of those reports. We now have a significant section of our youth, you know, actually calling for a, a, se a, a separate um, uh, countries within separate nations, you know, to be created out of our country. So if that is the case, I don't think it is too late at any point in time, rather than we talking down and giving others, you know, to 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 genuine people fighting, you know, for uh, to exercise their right to self determination. I'm not talking about terrorists or uh, bandits, but those who are genuine, peaceful, non-violent agitators for uh, to exercise their right to self determination. I think government should begin to talk to them um, so that we can alienate. And this is the standard practice in. Uh, all modern climbs, you alienate the peaceful agitators, you know, from those who are violent agitators, and then the state can take on the violent agitators. But as far as it is currently, the government is not talking to anybody, whether peaceful or violent agitators. So if we are able to engage our own, they, after all, they are our own citizens. If you're able to engage them, um, at least common sense will prevail. We need time to sort things out. The Buhari's get regime cannot do anything any longer now. It's now up to the new uh, incoming administration. And we need to address the concerns of our own people, whether we like it or not. What people are asking for is the structure of the country in a way that everybody can be stakeholders within their own country. And that's not too much, you know, to ask for decentralized. So I'm sure eventually we'll get to that point, but we need to de-escalate the security situation uh, currently, it is so insecure that it may affect voting in some parts of the country. Uh, let, let me toss this to you now, because we're, it's not, we're, we're not just talking about insecurity now. There are other things that are one way or the other bedeviling the electoral system in the country, and that's also INEC's duty in making sure that we can prosecute electoral offenders. INEC will always tell you that they're not law enforcement, but then uh, there, there, there can be some level of advocacy or push, um, knowing that there's an electoral act that we're all operating on, and that's what Mr. Shomi was talking about, and that the rules have changed. It might not be drastically, but then there are some rules that have changed. Um, again, talking about concerns, a lot of people are wondering if INEC will be as apolitical, as independent, as we hope for them to be, plus the fact that we have new technology that will help us to see uh, some receiving of the process to be a bit more freer and fairer. Um, since you're a lawyer, let's talk about this prosecution part of it. INEC always is getting darts from, you know, um, stakeholders as to prosecuting um, these electoral offenders so that it doesn't repeat itself. But then we see this continuous cycle over and over again. Who's to say that things would change now? Is that for me or for my colleagues? For, for you, um, Deji. This for me. <laughs> All right. Well, um, as it relates to prosecuting electoral offenders, I pulled out the statistics on INEC website this evening. Um, INEC has um, a list of the status of the cases that they've been prosecuted. And I can inform you that for the since INEC, um, you know, basically 
started all of this campaign, they have prosecuted 482 cases. 482 cases have been prosecuted by INEC. Of that number, 167 of those cases have been struck out or been determined by the courts. Only 24 convictions have been secured hmm. for electoral offenses. 24. Of the 24, we have four from Adamawa State, four from Kano, five from Kebi, one from Mondo, and three from Zafara. And INEC still has 315 cases that are still pending, um, that are yet unresolved as it relates to electoral offenses. Now, you would, know, you, would, you would recall that when the Electoral Act was passed, uh, a new offenses were created to try and plug the loopholes that have existed under our laws. For instance, Part 7 of the Electoral Act 2022 deals with electoral offenses in general. And you have um, fines that have increased from um, 100,000 naira to 1 million. For instance, if you use your voter's card properly, if a person gives his voter's card or sells it or receives somebody else's voter's card, that's an offense under the law. And you could go to prison for 12 months or pay a fine of 1 million or both. You have also other offenses that are provided for under the Electoral Act, uh, which include uh, improper use of vehicles. You, you recall that during elections, people use government vehicles to move around, to evade security checkpoints and to just move around and also engage in other electoral life and practices. So right now, the Electoral Act has already imposed um, a fine of 500,000 Naira on anybody who's found moving around with government vehicles or public operations vehicles for purposes of elections. And they also go to prison for six months. You also have several offenses, bribery and corruption, conspiracy. So if you look at that particular part of the Electoral Act, you'll, you'll find that, I mean, you have detailed offenses that also affect police agents, INEC officers, party agents, political parties. Recall that during elections, even party agents of the opposing parties usually um, engage in conspiracy, on, on the collect bribes and all of those things. Also, you will find out that under the Electoral Act now, if you engage in any violence on election day, you go to a polling, polling center and you start causing chaos or causing unrest, um, you could be arrested and prosecuted as well. But INEX, INEX's biggest challenge has always been that they don't investigate these offenses. That it's not in their power to investigate or to prosecute. And that's where you have um, um, the security agencies need to step up their game. Because you will recall that on every election day, you would find a civil defense, the police, even sometimes in the army, present on election day to keep the peace. So what I like to say is, Maybe it's high time you give us our own commission, our own electoral offenses commission, whereby we can be uh, involved directly in the investigation and prosecution of offenders. You know that if the police investigates and the police does not do a proper investigation, then it will be difficult for INA to go ahead and prosecute the offenses. If, for instance, uh, I think it was the last election in Nikiti, where you had videos circulating on social media of people sharing money. Uh, 1,000, 2,000, and there were videos going all around. And we were calling INEC's attention to it. We were tagging INEC um, on, the, on the timeline to look at what was going on. But INEC, we, we stated... Uh, stated uh, DJ, I'm so sorry. Once again, uh, we have had a problem with your connection. Um, back to you, uh, Mr. Shomi, quickly. Um, when Deji was talking about, you know, ele electoral violence, you know, half the time we're only looking at the violence that happens during elections, but then there are violence that, there's violence that happens before, during, and after. For example, let's go to Oshun State. Yesterday I had a conversation uh, with a PDP member um, from Oshun State and, of course, a member of the APC, and it, it seemed to be more of a blame game as to, oh, it's you, it's, it's your people, uh, and the other person is saying it's your people. In cases like that, shouldn't INEC jump on it uh, in, in tandem with security agencies to investigate? Because uh, it's a finger-pointing situation, and we can't just say, I mean, Oshun State has finished its election, but then there, there are election violence um, you know, happening. There's election violence happening in different parts of Oshun State. Um, getting most of these politicians to be pointing fingers at each other. As, as that is happening, what should be INEC's duty? Because again, it shouldn't stop on election day, right? 
Mr. Shobi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can yes. you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Now, what we, we, we've all been talking about is about, um, uh, about INEX um, duty mm -hmm. to ensure that offenses are prosecuted, one. And we've also been talking about INEX failure to prosecute people. Um, in the first instance, we... Mr. Shomi, are you there? We do not ignore that on um, election. Almost police officers are busy keeping, you know, um, watch at polling booths. In some cases, we have two police officers to a polling booth. Oh dear, I think that we are having a connection issue. We'll take a quick break when we come back. Not we'll when are big Mr. Shomi, just hold on. We're going to take a quick break, try to fix your connection, and then we'll be back. Stay with us. It's still plus politics, and we still have with us DJ Awobi Diye, uh, Awobi Yide, and of course, Biodo Shomi. Mr. Shomi, before we went on that break, you were trying to conclude on something. Yes. What I'm saying is that when you have a situation where you do not have enough police officers, you know, to police the country, and on polling booth day, they are only there to keep watch at polling booth. They are not in a position to arrest, effect arrest. If they do, they will have to leave the polling booth to go and get a person locked up. And what then happens? So we have a big problem with um, security agencies. We do not have enough of them to police election or to police the country. And that is a major hindrance. And when it comes to investigating cases, when police officers posted to different places from different parts of the country um, have to arrest people, when in reality they will not be in charge of investigation, they will be transferred back wherever they came from after the election. So what then happens is that you end up with a shoddy investigation carried out by an officer who did not actually effect arrest. In that case, uh, we've had a good record, a many, many record of cases um, failing due to lack of diligent um, prosecution as a result of poor investigation. Finally, Deji, um, as stakeholders, you know, in the electoral process, what do we need to do in support of INEC to have three fair, credible elections? Um, the APC candidate at some point um, expressed concern about the viability of the Beavers, and of course, INEC did hit back, but then. These are genuine concerns, but what do we do? Where do we come in in making sure that this process is seamless, finally? Well, I'm, well, I'm not sure that anywhere in the world you have um, an electoral process that is 100%, you know, in terms of its uh, execution. Mm -hmm. But what we should try to do is to build on the progress we've made over the years and try to ensure that now that we're raising the alarm concerning security, concerning the beavers, that all of these concerns are immediately addressed. And what we can do is, number one, we know, we know the number of polling units that are available on election day. How many policemen do we need? What do we need to do? How do we deploy them there? We know the gaps in electoral offenses and how they are fully investigated and prosecuted. How do we start plugging those loopholes now? So that anybody who catches an offender on that day quickly gives a statement, either by video evidence or in writing, and documents it. So that even if you are not around, we can tender those documents in evidence or even use the video in evidence. So we need to find the ways around this thing that by thinking outside of the box and ensuring that we can to make progress as a people as it relates to our electoral uh, process. Unfortunately, our time is fast spent. Deji Awobiyide is a legal practitioner. Biodo Shoumi is a political analyst. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having us. All right. Well, thank you all for watching. We'll take a quick break. When we return, we'll be talking about the NNPP and the inauguration of their campaign council. What's next as they gear up for the election? Stay with us. <laughs>